Hello, hello. This is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, we're talking to Tommy Walker. Tommy Walker is a good friend of mine and somebody that I consider a mentor. He's done amazing work at companies like Shopify, QuickBooks, uh, CXL, and now at his own content marketing consultancy. In this interview, we talked to Tommy about a ton of things, including his background, his reasons for being a content marketer and his motives that allow him to continue to flourish today. But we also dive into concrete topics like content operations and how Tommy, with this crazy uh, mad scientist engineer mindset, builds massive uh, scale systems and automations and processes that allow multi-site, multiple team uh, content operations, such as at uh, QuickBooks uh, Intuit, uh, to flourish. We also talk about storytelling and not just from a broad buzzwordy sense, but Tommy looks at storytelling very concretely on both a microscopic level within a blog post and a macroscopic level, building narrative structures over his content programs over the course of many months. So the interview itself is amazing and interesting, and I'm excited to bring it to you. But first, I want to describe briefly at a high level what this podcast is and what you as a listener can expect, since very likely this will be the first podcast that we publish. So the Long Game Podcast as the title suggests, is about the long term. We looked out at a bunch of different podcasts and, you know, stuff that we listen to, stuff that we like, and then generally stuff in the marketing and business space. And we found a plethora of podcasts, blog posts, content, and uh, the like all about the short term. So what works today, what actionable takeaway can you give me in the shortest amount of time, and uh, sort of rapid-fire questions that would not get down to the deeper issues and the underlying motives. So if I could sum up this podcast in a phrase, it would be play long-term games with long-term people. In that sense, with a podcast format, and especially with interviews, we are seeking to let the conversation flourish on its own accord. We're not going to come with a list of prepared questions. We may have a couple in mind, but we're going to let the conversation go where uh, the interviewee wants to take it, essentially. And in that sense, we're also looking to find the uh, deeper motives, the mental models, the archetypes, and the underlying structures that allow people to flourish in the content marketing and business space. So we're playing infinite games, essentially, and we want to play for the long term. That's what this podcast is about. And the first episode, I think, exemplifies that very well. Without further ado, here's Tommy Walker. Anyways, and look uh, where you are what, now. Right. What was like the, the pants thing? Like, did you, like, what's... I know you got fired for a pair of pants, but like, why? (laughs) (laughs) It's what I was just talking about. So uh, within the span of 24 hours, I had uh, gotten into a car accident, uh, had locked myself out of my house. And, um, and there was also like a wicked ice storm that had blackout conditions for like two weeks. So I was like washing my hair in bathrooms, like in the gas station bathroom sinks. And uh, after the car accident, I didn't have my work uniform uh, and I was selling cell phones at a major retailer at the time. I didn't have my work uniform. So uh, I went into work and had told the manager on duty, like, hey, these are all the different things that had happened in the last 24 hours. It was crazy. Um, And it was 2009. So like Wii's were super popular and nobody was getting them in at the time. So he just had Wii's on the brain. And was like, yeah, 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 okay, cool. We have Wii's. And I was like, sweet. So I went and I borrowed an outfit off the floor, uh, the sales floor, um, and re- like sold a whole shitload of stuff, outsold everybody in the district because, you know, that's just what I do. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I returned the pants and I bought the sweater that I had uh, borrowed. And I forgot my phone, my cell phone in the pants. So I called back and I, I basically said, I, you need to get my cell phone. I came back, I got it from HR. Um, and then two weeks later, uh, the, the manager on duty, the different manager on duty, the head manager came up and he was like, give us your walkie talkie and your keys, you're, on, you're, you're suspended. And suspended was just code for being fired. So uh, yeah, that was it. Wow. I, and I and I like protested at the time because like it was a twelve dollar an hour job and those are like the only twelve dollars I could get, right? Um and I was living in like a boarding house and like my laptop was broken and like all of this other stuff. And um and uh yeah, I like protested. I was like, but I didn't steal anything. They're like, Yeah, we know we watched the security tapes, we know you didn't steal anything. I was like, So why am I getting fired? And they're like, Well, it just looks sketchy. 
So like the one time I, I had been working since I was 13. So like I, I had a job at a greenhouse when I was 13 and just worked my ass off for years. And that was the first time I'd ever gotten fired. And I was like, you know what? Uh, this is the stupidest reason I could ever possibly be fired. So I'm just going to start working for myself after this. Oh my like, gosh. If it, I, like, I will never get fired over a pair of pants or some stupid shit like that ever again. Like, never. So I think we should just enter the interview like this. This is a great segue into <laughs> how did you go from that to CXL? Like, what was your path into content? Oh, God. You went um, from like getting fired over a pair of pants. Like, what happened next? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, I got my first client within the within two weeks. Um, I was studying. I, I was in Internet marketing uh, a couple of years prior to that. I got recruited from a gas station into a tech startup in the area. And um, OK, so, we got to pause there. How does the conversation start in a gas station for you to join a tech startup? So that's a great question. Um, my attitude, like I went, to, <laughs> we can just keep going backwards. Um, I had graduated from a film conservatory when I was uh, when I was that's where I went to college. And um, I moved home and I knew everything. So I got kicked out of my house and I was sleeping uh, on my buddy's couch and the gas station was across the street. I had no car, like no prospects. I wasn't cool at all. I wasn't nearly as cool as I thought I was. Um, but I worked at the gas station, but my outlook was always like, this is the only opportunity that I will ever have to meet every single type of person there is out there. Cause everybody needs gas. Like not everybody's going to show up at a target or a Walmart. Not everybody's going to like, this is the only opportunity I will meet everybody from every walk of life. And how hard is the job itself, right? Except for like sweeping mop floors, stock the cooler, make sure the coffee's stocked and know everybody's cigarette order. So like I took that sort of attitude of like, let's just get to know everybody and be myself, essentially show my personality. I've always been this kind of guy, at least uh, this level of energy and passion. Um, and if I, if I want something, like I, I decided I wanted to do mu music videos because I, um, I, I had that film background and, uh, I just started talking to people about wanting to do that. And they, um, somebody had a band and I followed them around for a summer and made a music video. It was great. Um, but one of the people, one of my regular customers, he came in and he was like half in the bag one night. Um, I knew his beer order. So I just made sure I knew the time he came in. So I just made sure it was there for him. And he was like, you know what? you have a really great personality and I think you would do really well at, at, at you know, the place and uh, you should come in and, and uh, you know, try to, try to get hired. So I went in and I talked to the sales manager. I did not get hired at that point, but I went back in when the sales manager changed. Um, and I eventually, I got the job and I failed into marketing because they, uh, I, I was sucked at, asking for credit card numbers, right? It was a, you know, it was a call, call center, essentially. Um, people were buying and selling timeshare, uh, spots to sell their timeshare. So I was selling intangible space for intangible property. That uh, was the way I like to put it. Um, so I failed into that. Uh, they said, you know what? We know you work hard. Uh, move over to the marketing department, see how you do there. You've got two weeks until you make your own money. I made my own money within the first week based on the pay structure that they had. <clears throat> the company I felt like really lost its way over the course of the year that I was there. It went from a $1 million a year company to a $5 million a year company. And I was one of like five people in the marketing department, three or five people It kind of grew. And I said, you know what? I, I can't be a part of this. I'm going to go make music videos. Turns out like local music, local musicians, local bands don't have money. So that wasn't really a great career path. Uh, so I ended up back at the gas station, the gas station to cell phones from cell phones to pants. Um, <clears throat> and then I had, uh, so hopefully that gives enough background there. This is a long Makes, story, man. It's I'm, like, I'm getting a sense of the type of person you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a 10 year long story. But um, so after that, uh, I was, I just kind of crunched and said, you know, I got to catch up on what I've missed in the internet marketing space. And I was doing like 18 hour days, like falling asleep, head on the keyboard, just drooling. And um, I had a friend who said, you know what? You need to get out of the house. Um, this is, you smell bad. Like it was, it was, it was awful. I was so focused and dedicated to trying to get this going. And I didn't know anybody at the Super Bowl party. So the question of it's inevitable whenever you're in a situation where there's new people, 
they're going to ask, so what do you do? And I had no other choice. I could say like, oh, I was working on a cell phone job and I got fired over a pair of pants, whatever. It was stupid. It was a stupid reason to get fired. But I told that story kind of like I'm telling it to you now because it's so ridiculous. And uh, I said, you know, I'm thinking about running my own thing, getting back in internet marketing, all this stuff. And uh, one of the guys there, his name was Hans. Um, he said, you know, I, I have a friend who does websites and uh, that's always like a really dubious, like you guys know, right? Um, <laughs> but I was like, I have no other prospects. So I, um, so I, 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 I met the guy. It turns out he didn't do websites. He built technology. He was one of like the first people doing geofencing and like encrypted mm -hmm. Wi-Fi and all this other stuff. So I did some SEO link building stuff for uh, his Ruby on Rails recruiting site and uh, just built out a recruiting practice from, or um, a consulting practice from there. A few years go by and I have uh, a client that kind of falls through some of those. Uh, I, I wasn't getting paid on time is essentially what that comes down to. So I fired the client. I had no reason to fire the client. My car was broken. My wife was pregnant with our second kid. Like, there was, there was so many other circumstances that said firing this client is a bad idea right now. Um, and I had been working for myself for about four years at that point. So like even Home Depot doing lead setting uh, appointments, right? They wouldn't hire me. I couldn't get a job cold calling because they thought that I wouldn't be, you know, listening to the man. Um, so I said, I've got no other choice but to blog for dollars. And... Uh, so that's how I ended up meeting Pep. Uh, I, I was looking at the pro blogger job board. I was scouring that, um, that conversion XL looked like it was the first one that really kind of made sense. This guy named peep was looking for, uh, someone to write articles. So, um, I was, it was like $200 an article at the time. And, uh, I wrote the first one and it got rejected. So, uh, I had no other choice but to write another one. He sent that one over to, he recommended me to folks over at Smashing Magazine. So like I got to do that one. Um, and then I started writing other articles for him. And then that turned into, um, what else did that turned into? Uh, Unbounce was one, Crazy Egg was one. Like it started to create this flywheel of other sites that I was getting to write for. And what would have looked like to most people like, oh, somebody trying to get their name out and like get a buzz going and everything. I was like, okay, so two articles is the oil bill, three articles is the rent. Like, you know, uh, and, and I was really looking at it from that very transactional perspective and just trying to like get as much work out as possible with as few edits as possible because I just didn't have time um, for that. And then Pep at the end of the year, had said, um, congratulations, you had the number one and number fifth or number six most trafficked articles on the site. And I said, congratulations, you have a full-time editor now. Uh, let's talk flat rate salary because I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it the way that I was doing it anymore. So yeah, uh, that's how I got to conversion Excel, Alex. It's a long story, but that's, that's awesome. How did you like, so you were busting ass on like doing all these guest posts and like freelance writing yeah, and yeah. like that's kind of a hustler's mentality but then you you joined cxl and I'm not, I'm not sure like what the process was there but when i met you you had this very um i don't know i would call it like a systems or process mindset like you, you yeah. built kind of like these interesting ways to like work with freelancers um your editorial guidelines and standards like you had all these things processed like how did that mindset change through the time at cxl from like all right i've got to write from like dawn until dusk for 18 hours a day just to pay the rent to like building a bigger system than just yourself. Yeah. Well, I was still writing on the side there. Um, so, cause you know, I was getting paid so much and it was good, but it wasn't enough. Right. Like I still had to make more money. Um, and the thing is, is before I came along, it was really just pep contributing to the thing. But um, I started bringing in more guest bloggers um, and things like that. And I, I had sort of discovered like, if I'm trying to manage all of this stuff through email, all of these submissions from the job that pays me the steady income, if I'm getting all of those, plus the, uh, the, the system or like the other guest posts that I'm writing and this sort of back and forth, if I don't have a system to manage all this, if I'm trying to just manage all of my images, right, just look at this on a micro level, any images that I'm inserting into these posts, if I don't, if I'm trying to do that out of the downloads folder, but 
I don't know which blog post these are supposed to go into because I'm balancing, you know, five at a time. Um, I got to come up with a file system. My wife was the one who recommended that. She was like, you got to come up with a file system for yourself. So uh, I did that. And then, um, <clears throat> and then after that, it was like, okay, well now we've got, you know, cause you're talking about the Trello process that I had put mm-hmm. together most like, um, it, it, I had said, okay, well, if we're going to be taking in like conversion XL, when I got there, I didn't realize the uh, impact that I had had being the editor and seeing how much it had grown because I didn't have access to the analytics at first. Once I did, I was like, oh shit, this is growing like exponent. Can I say bad words here? Yeah, totally. Uh, okay, cool. So I'm like, oh shit, like this is, this is, this has grown a lot and we were getting a lot more uh, buzz, more attention. And uh, I said, I can't manage all of this through my email and then everything else. So let's have a process, you know, that, that basically moves things from left to right um, from, you know, idea to in production to review to, I mean, you know, the process. Um, and if I, if I have this volume of stuff, then I can also manage my own work a lot simpler because I have this stuff all in the same place. And I have this one visual system that, allows me to keep track of it all. Um, so it's always, for me, it's always been just a, a matter of things being built organically out of necessity um, because uh, it, as the volume increases, as the contributors start, you know, doing their thing more regularly because we, we started bringing on more regular authors too, like Oit um, and a few others, uh, we needed to have a system to keep all of that in place. And then the other thing that I wanted to bring in, and I, this really evolved once I moved to Shopify, um, was I wanted our contributors to have visibility into each other's work too. So we could have start to have a cohesive narrative across all of the things. Because as a, as a guest blogger, one of the things I hated the most was pitching something and having it accepted and then having somebody else pitch the same thing and knowing that there was no duplicate of that, or I could have built off of something somebody else did, because the relationship with myself and the editor was always one to one, not one to many. So um, that was one of the things that I eventually evolved to once I moved past conversion XL. But yeah, what did it? What did That's it look a lot like of to, talking. <laughs> I mean, it's it's all good stuff. What did it look like to start implementing a process? I think. Sometimes when people are thinking about implementing process, they're thinking about like, what's the perfect thing to implement immediately? And I imagine you had to iterate as you went. Um, yeah. How did you think about that process? And some examples would be, would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, um, it's the life cycle of a piece of content, right? That was the thing that I really sort of broke down in my head uh, at first was what, what are the steps to get this piece done, right? I've got an idea. Uh, and if I don't track my ideas, then, um, then I'm going to lose track of probably some good stuff just because I forgot. Um, and then, you know, once I go from an idea, what do I do there? And that's in production. And then once I'm done with production, what am I going to do but find images? And then once the images are ready and I'm going to send it over to an editor, so that's going to be a full review. And really just breaking down the life cycle of a piece of content um, and, and what does that take to get it from idea to published? Um, as I've worked in different organizations now, those steps are basically the same, but there might be more in there now, depending on how many stakeholders there are. So at, at Conversion XL, it was like, okay, uh, idea in production, review, um, upload and publish, right? If we were trying to get ahead of ourselves. Um, that has evolved. Now I have idea, SEO review. So I'll have an SEO go in and they'll do an outline and everything then in production. So that moves over to the author. The author does their thing um, for review. And then it's not just uh, the editor doing the review, but it's also the images person. If there's a dedicated person doing images right in the bigger scale organizations, um, they can go in and see the raw draft and go like, oh yeah, I can, uh, there's enough for me to work with here then from that to upload and that moves over to somebody who is managing specifically the publishing aspect of it, what happens once it gets into WordPress, right? Start looking at those basic steps and then going, okay, well, how many players do we have to have involved in this? Um, and, and just really starting to like always breaking it down to the life cycle of a piece of content and who wants to own what and where. So 
that's really how that's evolved. And then from that status, you know, that, that sort of status thing, okay, now let's look at the due dates that are involved. Let's, what else can we put in the upfront part of the process? So Alex, you remember um, seeing, I had a whole boatload of automations in Trello that was saying, um, you know, title tag and, you know, having all of the sort of upfront stuff that we know would make a good piece that could then, if it ever got passed off to somebody else, they could take all of that information and uh, move it into the next stage. So, um, and yeah, I mean, that's the basics of it, right? Is like, you know, how do I move the piece of content from left to right? What are the different pieces of status? And then what do we add on top of that? Like due date, stakeholders, um, things like that. Um, what that eventually evolved into for me is going, okay, well now there's a bunch of manual tasks that are involved with this, you know, even pressing a button and, or, or dragging a card, right. Uh, in Trello, I, I now use Airtable and I am bullish on Airtable. So, um, I will, I will just plug them as many times as possible. Um, but the idea is, um, you know, the, even dragging a card from here to here, um, and adding the right people, this all takes time. And this is time that's taken away from, you know, the actual focusing on the content itself and the editing and, and the feedback, right. With the author. So from there I said, okay, well, how can I start to automate some of this stuff? So now all I have to do is flip a button, right. Flip the status from in production to for review. And then automatically the card moves, the right people are added. Like, and all of this information starts to become a little bit more automated. The, um, the rule of thumb with automation is for every task you automate, you save on average a minute's worth of time. At my peak automation, I had two full-time robots working for me. So 80 hours worth of automation every week. Um, and it's, it's, in, it's incredible to think about um, <clears throat> and I'm going to stop talking here in a second, but it's incredible to really think about um, how many little tasks are involved that aren't writing, editing, and making sure a piece is good for publish, right? So wanted to streamline that part of the process as much as possible after getting that basic of what are the different steps. Yeah, I would say that's one of the biggest learnings since we started a content agency is just the minutia that we didn't yeah. realize would go into each individual piece. So uh, yeah. I think we're all probably nodding in agreement there. Um, <laughs> I have a question for you, Tommy. Sure. Um, outside of automating the, I guess, the bridges between the tasks, yeah. how do you ensure that the tasks themselves like stay on time? Because I can imagine you know, the automation is great if the tasks are actually getting done in like a timely manner. Um, do you have like an editing timeline or like a, I guess a certain number of days you assign to each task to make sure that they, it does, you know, keep moving along? Um, yeah. So there's always the, there's always, when it comes to building any workflow, it's always the, the people part of the process and then the process itself. And uh, I've been fortunate enough um, at both Shopify and uh, most recently at Intuit, I've actually brought my, my authors into the process, right? So I'm not overseeing everything to the degree of like, let me flip every single status. I've got too much stuff going on, usually doing yeah. the editor thing, making sure the whole machine is running, making contacts with everybody. Um, and the, the automations themselves and the people themselves I've tried to make it as simple as possible. So uh, when they're ready, all they have to do is flip a switch. Um, yeah. I've never really had to worry, I think, about the, the thing that you're asking. Um, and that's because I've trusted the people to get their stuff going along in the process because they want to get paid. Um, right. Is essentially what it breaks down to is they want to know that I'm going to review the content as fast as possible. And the other part about that is um, some of the automations that I've had in place, it's not just, okay, flip this thing over and then it's there. It's like flip this thing over and then uh, whatever editor is assigned to this, right? When I start working with multiple editors, um, whatever editor is assigned to this, they're going to get a Slack notification as soon as it comes in. So I'm trying to bridge that gap, like bridge all of the gaps. Um, because if I were to, if I were to say to you like, hey, monitor Airtable all day, yeah. like wait for a piece Doesn't to happen. Work. 
it doesn't work, right? You're going to get to it between emails or meetings or whatever. But if you're spending a lot of your day in Slack, which most of us in this sort of world do, and Slack tells you, hey, you got something to, you, you got something ready for you to look at, then it starts to move like clockwork. And the way that I really try to think of it is, um, are you familiar with Near IL? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. I know you are, Alex, because, uh, yeah. because he's a big contributor. His big thing is um, he's a, a, a software development sort of, he doesn't really develop software, but he talks about building habit-forming products. And when I think about this workflow and when I think about workflow from that perspective, um, I almost look at it from a software development perspective, right? If, if how can, as, as, a, as a person, I've been trained by my phone to look at my LinkedIn notifications and email notifications and all of that. So how can I take that same software development mentality and develop those habits from the workflow perspective so content doesn't get lost, right? Yeah. That whole idea of like, you know, okay, well, it's sitting there in your review queue. Now what, right? How do you keep that process moving along? My review queue is coming to me and saying like, hey, uh, you haven't taken a look at this yet. Um, something I'm working on a little bit more now is also setting automated reminders for things that haven't been touched. So once it has, if the, if the status of that piece hasn't changed within a reasonable amount of time, we'll say three or four days, then you'll get another notification saying like, ah, you're okay. overdue, like catch up. Yeah. So as an editor, as the editor in chief, as the guy who's trying to oversee the whole thing and build out the publication um, as a whole, I want that workflow process and I want the people involved to be in that habit without it also becoming um something that is cumbersome, right? I don't, mm -hmm. you know, really trying to think about it as a habit forming thing because everybody here is a professional. So, yeah. yeah. I have another question on that human side. Um, but yeah, so the system sounds like, if I could sum up, it's like nudges and incentives for the people within the system. And then for you, it's sort of like visibility over the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and that to me, I'm going to drop a little heavy handed compliment to you on this one too. Um, so this is it. like, this is your engineer's mindset. Like you right. have a very like systems engineering, uh, like a product manager's mindset towards a lot of this stuff. But um, the reason I followed you and the reason I like your work is because you've got this other side that's very like uh, almost like artistic, like perfectionist. Um, like you really give a damn about the work. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I actually really respect people in general who like care about what they're doing. So yeah. there's this like qualitative, like almost perfectionist side too. And I, you can disagree with that if you want, uh, but that's how I see it. Um, so you've got this engineer side for the systems. How do you maintain that uh, sort of perfection, not perfection, that's the wrong word for it. But like, how do you maintain like high quality that you really, you know, you can be happy about at the end of the day um, in each note of that system um, with, yeah. with, within the program? Yeah. No, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so the, I never had, I didn't start with an engineer's mindset, right? Um, that I, I got to make that clear. I was always very good. I grew up as an actor, right? I spent 10 years as an actor. It was all creative. It was all script analysis and feedback and like having directors tell you, you suck. And like it, th that mm -hmm. feedback level that you're talking about was born out of, um, different critiques of performance, right? Um, one of the things that they would say in acting school is, uh, and I hate even calling it acting school, film conservatory, there we go, um, is if we catch you acting, you're su you suck, right? Like, what's the subcontext, um, you know, the subtext between things? What are you saying without saying uh, all of that stuff? That was where I, I sort of, I, I, that was my base. Um, so that's the giving a damn about the content. The engineer side of things was frustration. It was just born out of frustration of not being able to do that other part. Um, that I, I, I love, right? I really love being able to pull the best out of the people I work with um, and, and help them flex and grow. Um, so that level of like editorial feedback, I, I deeply care about that. Um, and it sh I, I think it shows, I hope it shows through the work that I've, you know, I've been responsible for through both my personal work, but also the people I work, work with. Um, but the... Yeah, it was just it was just born out of frustration. And as it was happening, right, I could feel 
I could feel the, the, the synapses firing, right? You know, like you have that exhaustion in your head. I could feel the, the pump, if you will. Um, and it's since gotten easier, but it was definitely not a part of my brain that I was uh, used to. And I'm glad at this point it actually looks like, you know, these are two things that were, you know, one came before the other. It was not the case. Um, so, yeah, and I'm still learning. I'm always learning. Like now one of the things I'm working on with uh, the workflow stuff is, um, and I'm trying to find a developer to help me do this, but um, doing automated keyword research within Airtable by doing uh, connecting the um, APIs from Ahrefs into there and then having a big old keyword list uh, from a multi-property perspective, something like that is one of the biggest challenges within large organizations is who owns the keyword, right? Does the blog team own the keyword? Does the, the SEO team hold the keyword? We're going to do it on a product page. Having that big old keyword list, I can now assign, you know, we can have that debate and have it up front as to who can actually own the keyword. So like this engineer mindset has become a muscle, um, but it's always in service to getting the right work done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, and the only reason I ever thought about that is because our SEOs uh, at QuickBooks were like, you know, hey, you guys wrote a blog post on some on landing page that we're trying to do and you, we got to take the blog post down. I'm like, no. You know, they win because the transactional pages uh, make more money. But, um, but, you know, it's like, okay, well, how do we solve that problem instead of just going like, all right, well, I guess we're just going to argue about keywords afterwards. It's like, well, no, the challenge here is visibility. How can we each have visibility into the stuff that we're working? You have a big old keyword list. I have a big old keyword list. Let's put these things together and then, you know, uh, have a debate and do it Game of Thrones style as to who owns what. So, uh, First off with the keyword thing, I feel like we're probably going to steal that or like that idea. I saw Ali and David nodding there. I uh, saw that, that integration tweet thing. yesterday. Back off. Back off. No, I'm just Did kidding. Did you ever find <laughs> someone to help you develop that? No, it's a, it's a brand new idea. It's a brand new thing. So it's uh, patented. Um, <laughs> I submitted it for copyright already and nobody's allowed to do it. Right. Uh, no, I can, if, if you guys um, know people who can do the API connection, uh, I'd love to hook up there. <laughs> yeah, we should hash that out. I've done some API work with SCM Rush's API, uh, yeah. not AHF, so I'm not as familiar, but it is possible and we do a lot of that stuff um, internally. So yeah, we could always hash that out later. But, right, cool. uh, I wanted to ask you another question, and this, my memory is foggy, but this, um, your background as an actor and um, yeah. studying that, like you brought that into your work, I think at Shopify, in that weren't you running like almost like seasons? Like it was like you would do sequential kind of themes on different topics. Yeah. Like, again, it's kind of foggy, but can you tell me about that? Like how you approach that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so my foundation in any of the blogging work that I've ever done has been in, uh, in acting, right? Um, it was always like, you know, what's a brand, uh, but, but a script analysis, right? We have the opportunity now to interact one-on-one. -on -one. Um, this was the mentality originally. Uh, we, have the inter we have the ability to now be one-on-one -on -one with people who are also sharing cat photos. So like, how do we do that? Um, when I was at Shopify, really had the opportunity to take a lot of time. I spent three months just sort of coming up with the strategy and the plan. And the way that I looked at it is every quarter is an act, right? You have a four act structure in pretty much every, everything, every movie, every TV show. Uh, there's, always, there's always a four act structure in it over however many episodes or seasons that you have. So my concept was twofold. One, we're going to look at the year as a four act play, right? Or a four act uh, structure. And then taking another concept into play, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Which was sort of brand new when I was starting to come up with this idea. We'll, um, we'll have two parallel tracks, right? Where we're telling one story on Mondays and we're telling another story on Thursdays. But the inner, there will be an intersection between some of these concepts that will play into each other. So now we're creating this net of content, if you will. And then from week to week, we're building out the, um, the sequence. And then from month to month, we're building out the, um, the I can't remember the phrasing now, I should. Uh, this is basic stuff, Tommy. Um, 
essentially we're building out the narrative um, week to week and then month to month and then quarter to quarter. So there is this ongoing sort of, it always feels like it's building towards something. Um, and that's one of the things that I feel like uh, a lot of blogs in general, a lot of publications in general um, kind of miss, right? It's not, it, it's a repository of articles um, in a lot of cases or a repository of videos, but that feeling, right? Whether or not you're reading from the beginning, whether or not it even looks like there's a starting point, um, that feeling of there's something more happening here is what brings people to return, right? That's where you get more of your direct traffic from. That's where you get more of your return visitors from. And to me, uh, return traffic is actually probably the most important thing, especially in high value B2B sales, because if you're only going after those net new, you know, and a lot of, a lot of SEO search people want to get the new traffic, right? But if you're not getting that return traffic, you're never getting to that consideration point. And then you're always having to work harder on building up the top of your funnel. So, um, so yeah, and, and that, at, at Shopify, I don't even know if I'm answering your question here, Alex, but at Shopify, um, we ended up having, I think at its peak, a 60% return visitor rate um, which is like, uh, I, I've seen, you know, 12% and 8% in other, other organizations. And to have that 60% as one of my like true North metrics was really good because that's a high consideration when I was at, it was Shopify plus that was a high consideration product. People were really trying to consider switching their entire platform in a lot of cases. Um, it was really important that they could come back and trust that we knew what we were talking about especially because at the time we were a challenger brand. Um, and, and it was, it, I, I have to feel like as the first marketing hire, uh, that played a huge role in, um, in that because there always was just, there always felt like there was something more coming or something more that you missed, right? Um, I could expand on that a little bit more, I guess, but I wanna stop there because I'll just end up rambling. Well, it's an interesting framing now with that light because it sort of marries the two parts that I had spoken about before, which is like the artistic side, which is like the vision, uh, perfecting the content, sculpting the quality, and then engineering the system. Yeah. It's out, and maybe this is too far on the metaphor, but it sounds like you envision yourself as sort of a producer role. Yeah. It's like that would be the person that puts the pieces together and makes sure everybody's handing off and like doing their part, but also things get done on time. Like you, you ship it to market on time, all of that stuff. W yeah. Would that be an accurate assumption there? Yeah, um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've called myself the editor in chief for a long time, but as I'm starting to, um, as I'm growing my own thing and really thinking about, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, I actually think of myself less as an editor because that puts a lot of stigma, I guess, or there, there's like a association with what an editor really is. And I'm a publisher, right? Like really what it comes down to is I'm a publisher and I build publications. Um, so, and if I were uh, on a TV show, then it would be a showrunner, right? I'm the one that's mm -hmm. kind of helping get the whole thing going um, and working with the, everybody from the writing staff to design and that department and graphics and, and all that. So, um, yeah, uh, just to touch on what I, what I was going to say before, um, I want to build the sense, right? And we don't have this now because everything is bingeable now. Um, but I want to build the sense of like, if you pick up on a show, like three or four episodes in, right? Like, remember when you actually couldn't watch all TV at the same time? Um, if you came into a show, you know, four or five weeks late, I want the sense for the publication that I'm running that you have to go back. I want you to have 15 tabs open by the time you're done with my site and I want to hold on to you. I want you to be late for work mm -hmm. um, by getting lost in this sort of net of content that we're putting together. And that's, that's d done by design on the calendar, but it's also goes back to that other side of things where it's, we care very deeply about every single thing that we publish and that there's this sort of interconnected narrative that's beyond just this one article that we're looking at right now. And on a tactical level, that includes internal linking and callbacks, right? Yeah. Like that's something that would bring somebody back to that previous piece of content. Yeah, exactly. It's foreshadowing and backlinking. Yeah. What's like, what's an example of 
like the the topic or I don't know. I'm trying to wrap my yeah. mind around this in terms of like what I've written before and yeah, yeah, yeah. what that would so, look like besides so, doing like part one of three or something. I don't know. I can't yeah, picture sure. outside of that. So this is the example that I've used before is, um, and Alex, this might seem familiar to you too because of conversion XL. It's, you know, how to make the perfect website, right? And then the subheader, the subheaders there might be, you know, have a usable navigation and then you start breaking down the individual pieces, a hero image, subheaders, you know, calls to action, uh, you know, little button texts and, and all of this stuff, uh, uh, a contact customer service page, right? You have that one masterpiece and then each one of those subheaders essentially becomes its own article, right? So we have that one big piece and then we're starting to break down, you know, what's a cool, what's a good navigation, right? What makes good navigation? Because that's a study that people go into all the time. What makes a good subheader? What makes a good hero image, right? Tactical feeling. People develop parasocial relationships um, with, with really good copy and mirror neurons are, you know, if you're telling a good story, the mirror neur neurons fire off. And um, if you're looking at a picture that looks really tactical, right, then uh, those sensory inputs in your brain can start to, you can trick the sensory inputs in the brain, Right, so you can start to really go deep into each one of these subjects, and that for me is one track, right? Mm -hmm. That that's the Monday track. If if we're talking about that, and we're talking about like say feedback loops, right? Use feedback loops to uh, improve your copy, right? That just might be a little throwaway line there. On Thursday, we're going to start with feedback loops. And we're going to go from feedback loops to customer service and, you know, starting to take break that feedback loops basic concept and start to break that down even further. So then when we tie it all up at the end, we're talking about how do you build the perfect website, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and not just how do you build the perfect website? How do you build the perfect um, publication that is informed by, your readers and that is informed by, you know, really solid design and, and like all of the neuroscience and behavioral science and all of this stuff that's going on behind it. That's just, that's just an example. There's, mm -hmm. I could come up with a, a million others, but that's the one that's probably the most uh, accessible to me at the moment. Yeah. So, as, as I'm listening to this, I, I'm reflecting on moments where I'm reading a blog, maybe like James Clear, Shopify, and like, yeah. oh, this is an interesting topic. Let me click this link. Oh, this yeah. is interesting. Let me click this link. And like by the end of the article, I have like, <laughs> yeah, 10 tabs. And I'm like, great, now I need to read these other articles. Oh, wait, I have a meeting to get to. And <laughs> each of those articles leads to me clicking into more links. Right. Now, it, now that you're adding some structure, I, I see how that, that all ties together now. That's yeah, and if you're, if you're talking about Shopify, then no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, but no, that's the point, right? Like that's that's the point, and I think that um, from from a from a publishing strategy perspective, I'm not even going to call that a content strategy. That's from a publishing strategy perspective. Like when you go e-commerce, now you go Shopify because you just spent you know half of your week, or, or how much of your not not half of your week. That's that's an exaggeration, but how much of your reading time have you spent on this one site versus the millions of other sites that you could have spent your time on, right? Um, so who grabs your attention? Who holds that attention? And how much of the share of that limited reading time that you're going to put together in a week, um, how much do they have? So, Did you typically assign the same, like, series to the same writer or two to keep, like, the voice consistent or... Um, it depends. Uh, so from, from, and this goes into the people management perspective of things. I might, but I also will have, um, and I've, I've done this plenty of times where, uh, you know, I've got, I've got people to feed, right? So having one person do all of it is actually, so right. I'm going to say, I'm going to start back and say no, no. Um, because I've got people to feed and, uh, and the level, the depth of the content that I want is too much for one person. Mm -hmm to Makes keep sense. doing week after week. It's like, Alex, you know where I came from. <laughs> you can't have one person do all that stuff week to week without mm -hmm. killing them by the end of the month. Yeah, um, especially the long form stuff that you were publishing too. It's yeah. incredibly intense. Yeah, but because your brain just gets, you, your brain melts by the end of it. Um, but I have had, 
you know, group conversations, small group conversations, and have encouraged the authors to work with each other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, because they all have visibility inside the, the pieces in production, I might say, as I'm reading a piece, as it's being developed, right? Like I'll tag somebody else who's in this, you know, who's writing the next thing and say, Hey, there's a really good callback in here, or here's something that you can reference that they're doing. Um, <clears throat> I've worked with primarily, I've, I've, in my entire career, I've had two full-time employees, but I've worked with freelance teams of six to 10. Um, and I've always operated from a team perspective uh, because as a, as a freelancer coming from that freelancing world, like I said, I hated the idea that I didn't know what anybody on the rest of the publication was doing. Oh yeah. Right? I hated there's, that there's, feeling too. Yeah. There's just no context as to what's happening all around me. Um, and therefore I only have my own little bubble and frame of reference. So by encouraging the team to work with each other, and sometimes I've doubled uh, authors up on a piece too. Like this happened a lot at QuickBooks where I had an author who was uh, Ken Boyd. I'm going to shout him out. Um, Ken Boyd, who was a, uh, one of the authors of several Accounting for Dummies books, um, he would write a lot of the accounting stuff. Like, it just makes sense. Um, and then I'd have Eric Carter, who was the in-house um, uh, legal counsel for uh, a major multinational corporation. A lot of those things would go hand in hand, accounting and lawyering. Lawyering? Attorney? Lawyering. Um, <laughs> lawyering works. <laughs> lawyering, sure. Um, and like setting up businesses and stuff like that. So I would have them work together on pieces. Um, and, you know, they get to develop that relationship with each other. Um, and in some cases, I don't know if this is the case for them, but in some cases it, it helps them build out their network and it extends mm-hmm. beyond just the work that we're doing together. And like, I care really deeply about the people that I work with. And I'm fortunate that I've been able to work with companies that just bankroll uh, people who are incredibly talented and, and that I get to work with um, and help them develop that work. So, yeah. Uh, I have some non-content marketing related questions, some rapid fire things, unless sure. Allie and David have more questions here, but otherwise we could jump into these the fun questions. Yeah. Well, actually these, so I, I have can, two sections here. I can oh, go, go longer too, if you want to. So. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. We, I, I think I have a hard stop, but um yeah, we, we should be able to get through these and then we can always Wait. do a follow up. No, I can't actually. I have oh, yeah, you just immediate. said you have du- I, double see, booking. This is, this is <laughs> what I'm talking about with the two calendars. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, okay. That's funny. Fun questions. Okay, so the first one, I have two parts. The first one's going to be overrated or underrated. Uh, I'm stealing this from Tyler Cowen's podcast. You sure. Basically, I, I say an item and you say whether it's overrated or underrated and you can pass too. So these are actually related to content marketing, uh, most of them anyway. So let's do it. Uh, qualitative research. Uh, underrated. Okay. Storytelling. Underrated. I thought so. Content <laughs> promotion. Underrated. Really? Okay. Link building, manual link building. Overrated. Okay. Uh, editorial calendars. Underrated. <laughs> yeah. Keyword research driven content. Uh, I plead the fifth. I don't know. Pass, yeah. it, it, it has its place. Fair enough. Shouldn't, uh, be, shouldn't be the entire strategy though. Google's a ficky, fickle lady. Yeah. I think, I think it gets myopic if that's your only strategy, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, AB testing. Underrated. Personalization. Overrated. <laughs> Content marketing in general. Pass. <laughs> All right, cool. That's all I've got for the overrated and underrated. Now I've got some random kind of rapid fire questions. Sure. So these are going to be less like related to marketing. Uh, what's your like most gifted book? And if you don't gift books, just the most like recommended book. Sure. Uh, Story by Robert McKee. Okay, cool. Yeah, I haven't read that. I'll have to check that one out. I'm looking to get more into like storytelling and psychology and stuff. So that'll be cool. Yeah. Um, that one in uh, Lou Hunter's Screenwriting 434. Wait, didn't you... Didn't you take a class by Robert? Or did. he didn't he teach? Yeah, I did. Can I you took talk a, about that? a three day intensive study. It was like twelve hours a day for three days. The guy was ridiculous. Oh. He's like in his eighties too, and he just nonstop. Um, it was great. It was great. Uh, a lot of it is just what he goes through in the book, 
but it's a reinforcement of a lot of that material. And uh, yeah, I've got two two um, notebooks full of my notes um, from that. I filled two um, moleskins. So did, did you find it particularly valuable in your job with content or do you, would you recommend it to people outside of that field or yeah, I guess like who would you recommend take something like that? Anybody who is trying to tell stories. So um, I took it from the filmmaking from the film perspective, but uh, he also has story nomics, which is the application of the same principles to business. Um, personally, I don't like, you know, mixing the two. Um, I just, I, I think that the, something overrated, underrated, overrated, the way people talk about storytelling in business mm. is awful. And it becomes a buzzword and it's completely diluted. Um, and and it, I, I feel like it loses a lot of its meaning, right? Um, but taking it from the pure perspective of just like, how do you tell a story um, without the application of like, and to make money, um, I, I feel like that was a lot more pure and uh, I would recommend it to anybody. Um, having said that, like the storynomics course might be, it probably is amazing, but, um, I just look at it from that pure perspective, uh, of, of telling story and structure. Who do you admire professionally? Who do I admire professionally? Me? No. Um, I don't know, actually. I'm not really looking at, I try not to get caught up in the cult of personality, um, that is out there. So, uh, you know, having worked with Pep, I admire Pep. Having worked with Ollie uh, of Unbounce, I admire him. Um, <clears throat> I admire, who else do I admire? I admire, I mean, admires, I admire the work more than I admire the people. Mm. You know, cool. um, at the end of the day, like most people don't care about the bylines, which is a really like nihilistic thing to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd never, I mean, like I said, like when I was doing my guest blogging stint, it was so I could pay my oil bill. It wasn't to, to get my name out there. Right. So, um, it was a nice byproduct, but try not to get caught up in the people, uh, just the work. You didn't write 30,000 words for exposure. No, no, God, no. I wrote 30,000 words so I could get out of debt and put my car <laughs> back on the road and make sure my family could eat. Uh, cause yeah, at that, at that time, my, uh, my engine in my car was blown. So, uh, I couldn't go anywhere. It was a matter of being able to go to the grocery store autonomously. So <laughs> valid, valid reason to write content for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, what are, what, what's your favorite blog right now? Um, I'm really into the hustle. Um, and I'm getting back into founder. Um, Honestly, I don't read a lot of blogs. Uh, I'm, I'm a lot of heads down time. And I'm finding that blogs in general um, are giving way to newsletters. Mm. Um, I agree. Yeah, we were talking about that on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of newsletter stuff. Um, I'm actually, I, I just signed up for it, but I haven't really gotten into it yet. Um, John Benini's uh, Very Good Content. Um, we were just we were talking, just about, talking that about literally that. right before this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't started reading it yet, but the stuff he's putting out on LinkedIn is pretty incredible. Um, and then Eddie Schleier, Schleier, am I saying his name right? Uh, the stuff he's doing with, or no, that was some good content. And then <laughs> Eddie's is very good content or something like that. Um, I, 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 if, I, if I want to admire, yeah, I want to be Eddie when I grow up. So um, yeah, there we go. I think that's a better that's answer. Cool. I like that answer. Um, and in, uh, in order for us to get to our next meetings, we can wrap up here. So thank you very much for talking to us. And uh, I guess, do you have any like uh, final words you want to say uh, or like where, where to find you online, like that kind of thing? Yeah. So um, pretty much everywhere is uh, Tommy is my name. <laughs> so LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, everywhere. Tommy is my name. Um, try to keep it simple. Uh, and yeah, if, um, if uh, parting words uh, would be, you know, tell a story. Think about this stuff from a much bigger perspective than just putting out individual pieces of content. There's so much more uh, to it. Have a vision um, and, and really drive towards that vision more than the tactical stuff in my mind because it's the vision that gets people bought in um, than whether or not you're writing an article about you know, how one star or how reviews are good for your business. Like 
you know, it's, yeah, have a vision. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> Thank you very much.